Uh, we're going to start our first panel now. It, this panel is Artificial Intelligence and Alternative Data, where the panelists will discuss the latest trends in private equity, venture capital, and hedge funds. Moderating this panel will be Peter Marber of Aperture Investors. Uh, Peter is the founding member and portfolio manager at Aperture Investors. Prior to that, he was head of emerging market investments at Loomis Sales and, and, and Company, HSBC Global Asset Management, and was a partner at Wasserstein, Perella and Company. He's also taught at Columbia, John Ho Johns Hopkins, Harvard, and NYU. He's also authored six books. Thank you, Ryan. When I hear a long bio like that, all it does is make me feel old. Actually, you come to a tech conference, it's really interesting. I look out in the audience. I mean, I've got cell phones older than some of you if we're looking out there. So we have an interesting panel today with three uh, practitioners, uh, some from Wall Street on the sell side, some from the buy side, and also we have uh, an active uh, tech CEO. You know, what's interesting about technology is that if you think back to the Industrial Revolution almost 200 years ago, there's always been a fascination with technology, right? Uh, for investors, we all want to get in on the next new thing. But the other thing is that Wall Street and finance often is interested in that technology too because the technology can somehow improve our chances uh, for better investment performance. It certainly was the case, let's say, when the Telegraph and Morse code were first introduced. It wasn't introduced to make Wall Street guys money, but it didn't take people that long on Wall Street to figure out how they could get information faster by using uh, the Telegraph back in the 1830s. And of course, we can go flash forward to sort of the 1980s. How many of you out there have a Bloomberg terminal, right? I'm sure a lot of you, or if you've functioned on one, talk to Wall Street professionals about what life was like on Wall Street before and after the Bloomberg in terms of the data that we now require. And obviously, if anybody's read Michael Lewis's Flash Boys, we know that the ability to even have hardware to get you information faster often can be turned into some kind of competitive advantage. So with me again, we have three great panelists. To my right, Robert Fagan. He heads research at Cowan & Company. He previously was at Bank of America, Bear Stearns. He is an institutional investor, all-American research team. Let's welcome Robert Fagan, everybody. And to his right, we have Eric Yu, who's the CEO uh, and founder of gtech.com, one of our sponsors out here. He'll talk a little bit about the products and services that they're offering to Wall Streeters. And to his right is Samir Gupta, who heads up market intelligence for Steve Cohn's Point72, the large uh, hedge fund. He's previously worked at JP Morgan, at Goldman Sachs, and at Tata Consultancy. Let's give everybody a great big hand. Age before beauty, we'll start, all right? I'll go with Robert because you know, you've been part of the technology scene for, for decades and you've kind of seen lots of uh, technologies come and go. Um, what are you looking at today? What's the most exciting technologies? How are these applications being used by industry as well as by Wall Street? And also tell us a little bit about what Cowan is doing now in the information space. Sure. Um, so that was a super graceful way of saying you're really old. Um, <laughs> But, yeah, I mean, when I started in, on Wall Street, I mean, the, the exciting thing was when there was a blast fax machine, and all of a sudden you could send research reports to more than one person at a time. So I've seen a lot of different waves. Um, data is a wave that, um, that I think has just begun. It is very nascent. So just to put it in perspective, I think when you look at sales of data uh, in terms of um, uh, dollar sales, it's fairly low right now. And um, it's just the beginning of a wave. And it's somewhat analogous to, you know, back in the 90s when expert networks came on the scene. Um, nobody really had the foresight other than a few people to recognize that this would become a billion dollar business. And uh, data is, is very, very similar to that. Um, I would say also not all data is created equal, and uh, our clients are beginning to experiment and are finding that out. Um, they're beginning to be much more discerning in terms of the kind of data that, um, uh, that they buy and that they'll accept. 
Um, and also, I think important to keep in mind that data is really a tool. Data in and of itself is nothing without asking the right questions and understanding how to manipulate it and understanding um, you know, how it could apply to your investment process. So what we did at Cowan is a, a global investment bank. Um, our research department is very large. And we noticed, uh, starting about last year, that our clients, the buy side, were starting to ask for certain data sets that our research analysts had developed. And uh, we started a division called Kyber, Kyber Data Science. And that's really designed to uh, commercialize and monetize some of the uh, data sets that we developed internally, as well as bring to market um, some third-party data sets that we partner uh, that we partner with uh, in order to help our clients uh, make better decisions. And so, um, it's interesting. Um, this this sort of like plethora of data. It's only going to get bigger with things like Internet of Things, right? Is this is something? It's clear that Cowan is looking beyond just sort of selling current data sets. You think that there are going to be new data sets over time that are going to be developed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there there are new data sets all the time. I think the the issue now is there aren't a lot of good data sets. Um, so data has to be clean. It has to be correlated to uh, stock results. Um, there are all kinds of flaws in, you know, sort of wave one of uh, what we're seeing in the data market. Um, you know, if you look at, at uh, lists of alternative data vendors, very few of them check all of the boxes that uh, the buy side requires for um, high quality correlative data. Um, so we will see a lot more data, but how it's structured and what kind of data um, is, is relevant and useful. Um, I think will at least initially be fairly limited. If we were a baseball game, what inning do you think we might be in? Not here? even first. We're, Not we're, even the first inning. We're warming up. Yeah. That's good for our we're next set. Eric, you, you're the CEO and founder of uh, Global Tone Communications. To call it, we're calling it GTCom. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in the big data space and artificial intelligence? Right. Uh, actually, GTCom is quite new company. A five years history, starting from 2013. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, from very beginning, we're providing the uh, call center, multilingual call center for our big client is uh, China UnionPay, Alibaba, Ctrip, and Baidu, a SoftBank, and also the Amazon's global call center located back in China. So uh, per year, we actually providing like uh, more than 7 million minutes calls from all over, all over the world for our clients. Uh, and also, we're providing the weekly and monthly fintech uh, big, uh, big data uh, analysis for our like China Union page. Uh, we starting from 2014. We, we started working on the uh, machine translation. Uh, so we are one of the very key players um, back in China. Uh, also globally, compared to like uh, like Google Translate, Baidu Translate, or even Microsoft are being translate. So we're providing our vertical machine translation solutions globally. Uh, well, starting from 2015, we, we started to work on the big data. The big data right now, we are uh, one of the leading the big data uh, providers, uh, I, mean, I mean solution provi providers. And we starting working on the alternative, t uh, alternative data. Uh, right now, we are providing the, uh, the alternative data for uh, like uh, Nuremberg Berman, PIMCO, and JP Morgan, and also back in China, we're providing all those data for the uh, four major uh, commercial banks like ICBC, the Bank of China, and also Bank of uh, Construction. Uh, and uh, well, even back in China, uh, because uh, right now, daily, we have the global alternative data. Daily, we have uh, 50 million alternative data. Uh, uh, and also more than like a 10, uh, 1 billion social media analysis. Uh, so that uh, we have uh, more than 100 uh, like uh, uh, industrial experts working on like a uh, sentiment analysis algorithms. And also we set up a different uh, like a standards for uh, to have in-depth on the alternative data. So that, that what we, we do. That, and also, we, we, uh, in the past uh, three months, we've been working on that, uh, the, the China Shanghai Stock uh, Composite, uh, com uh, composite uh, Index uh, Projection. 
and also the Nasdaq and the Dow Jones uh, in, uh, indices uh, projections. So we, we've been trying to uh, have an in-depth on the, the alternative data. Yeah, thank you. So let, let's just go back. So you said you really got your start working with Alibaba and you said and, and Amazon. Is it mostly looking at um, retail sort of spending habits? Was that really what you first started mining? What was the, the first big data project that that GTCom worked on? Yeah, sure. uh, that actually, we, we provided the FinTech uh, big data analysis for China Unipay. And uh, because uh, at the very beginning, we, we provided like a 12 languages multilingual call center for China Union Pay globally for all the merchants and all the custom uh, car users globally. And we uh, utilizing the uh, bot, the, uh, uh, the, the bot within the uh, call centers, analyze all those uh, the speech uh, content and providing generate the weekly uh, report for uh, China Union Pay. Uh, for the user behaviors and the car users and what kind of the problem they have globally. And then later on, we uh, collaborated with the Shanghai Stock Exchange and Shenzhen Stock Exchange and developed the, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange uh, indices. And uh, it's hopefully it will be launched within this year. It's, uh, it's kind of the, the official Hong Kong uh, indices. Yeah. Excellent. Samir, maybe we could talk to you, uh, because you, you sit in an interesting seat. You head up market intelligence for 0.72. I actually don't head up market intelligence, yeah. but uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a director there, so. Is your, uh, is your mic on? So at 0.72, you, you can kind of look at the data and tech sector as, again, something to invest in, right? There are probably interesting companies out there that are, that are uh, like GTCom, right, that you can, you can trade on. But also, you're probably having to incorporate a lot of artificial intelligence and these data sets now into your investment process. And as I mentioned, um, very few people I know on Wall Street don't use Bloomberg and all the data that it provides you and dumps it into, you know, a variety of their own proprietary trading models and stuff. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what this alternative data space is about. Are you investing in it? Are you using alternative data? Uh, is, there, is there more use than hype? Is there a little hype going on right now? I think uh, there, there's definitely a lot of hype. When, whenever there's something new, there's a lot of hype and then the hype dies down and then rationality takes over. Uh, so this is sort of one of those, blockchain is another example, not gonna go into that. Uh, but so I think you asked about two questions. There's an investing in AI uh, technology companies and then there is how to use AI. Why don't I start with the latter first because that's what we do, that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think, I think it's, it's good, it's sort of, uh, it's important to look at things in perspective. About 10 years ago, investors mostly cared about fundamental data of a company and that could literally come straight out of a 10 year or queue. Uh, you supplemented that with stock prices and some corporate actions and reference data and you could, you could have a really good sort of view into what it was. Uh, fast forward to now, we are all emitting data right now through our mobile devices. Uh, some of us are wearing you know, wearables which are also emitting devices. Five years from now, semi-autonomous will take over in cars, and that'll be a lot of data. So, th th and that, that is really the alternative data, which is, it's away from your traditional stuff. It's coming from all angles. It's coming literally from 360 degrees around you. And, and this is where humans are almost like, it's impossible for a smart human or a bunch of uh, smart humans to come together and solve it without using technology, and that technology is, is really sort of being powered by artificial intelligence, which I sort of think as something that can have that 360 degree view, and if done right, can simplify and abstract what's going on in a very simple dashboard for you, thereby augmenting human intelligence, and, and doing it such that this data evolves very quickly. It, it, changes, it changes very quickly, and therefore, the feedback loop is very important. I think that's the differentiating factor of AI, is the tight feedback loop and ability to learn in an unsupervised fashion 
and then quickly feed it back so the next time when that situation comes up, it knows what to do and it knows, it knows a more informed decision than it did the, the, the first time around. So uh, just a question, without giving away a lot of Stevie Cohen's secrets, um, have you used satellite imaging yet? So the way we look at data is, if there is data out there, which first and foremost, if it passes through a very rigorous compliance vetting process, uh, we will look at it. And two, if it can meaningfully explain a very small trend in this overall business world, that's of interest to us. I, I don't think there is a, there's an AI which says buy this stock or sell this stock. There is an AI, it's almost like an integral calculus, which is like you do small mm. little things all of a sudden, and that sort of forms a digital mosaic for the human to become really smart. So do tools. you use, I'm wondering if you use like social media feeds, um, if, if some of the data that you're bringing in includes sentiment data, credit card sale, uh, are all these now new ingredients that you have to integrate somehow to make investment decisions? Well, social media is being used by pretty much everyone, so you know, that's meaningful data and, and you, you got to look at it. If you are investing, I think, I think the, the day of sell side being the information uh, conduit are gone and, and, and I, think, I think it's a very democratic world and, and uh, thankfully there are advances like AI which help you do that job. I'll quickly address your investing question as well. I'm personally very bullish on what's going on there. So you've got Silicon Valley taking the lead through the cloud providers and really building the platform layer for artificial intelligence. And oh, by the way, this is, this is not extremely non-trivial and those guys have the talent pool to build those things. And then you've got the startups sort of coming and building on top of that in a very, very focused vertical fashion. So you take one specific problem and you solve it really well. And that's really sort of the core of AI. It's not about boil the ocean, one size fits all. So do you see it as somewhat decentralized where different industries that have different domain expertise suddenly start generating certain data uh, themselves, right, at the very ground level? Context is extremely important. This is where AI fails and this is where we will still uh, emerge victorious despite all these powerful machines around us. So Robert, would you say now we actually probably have more alternative data than we do the artificial intelligence necessarily to process all of that? Wh which one do you think is more advanced right now? So there are a lot of experiments out there for true artificial intelligence. What you're talking about is um, autonomously uh, uh, having a machine make unbiased predictions. And so you don't ask Siri or Alexa whether you should buy or sell a stock these days? Right, and, yeah. and you, know, you, you have to process not just available data, but look at um, all kinds of correlations. But I think most important um, in all of it is asking, the, uh, asking a computer to break down traditional boundaries of what actually drives securities. And having uh, a machine um, try to find new correlations, new relationships that perhaps human beings uh, didn't know about. What complicates that is the smarter the artificial intelligence gets, the more it converges, right? And so it's, you know, it becomes predictive, and then everybody's on the same page, and then you have to leapfrog again and have something that's predictive and then it gets leapfrogged again. It's, it's very, very difficult to keep pace um, on true artificial intelligence. So it's interesting, um, what is it? It's been about 20 years since, uh, was it uh, Deep Blue, Big bit, bit, Beat, Kasparov and Chess, right? And what's interesting is a lot of people had predicted that the game of chess would be abandoned, right? Why play if you know, robots could, which is basically artificial intelligence, right? Could actually beat you. And yet, what's interesting is that there's a fascinating chess world out there now where it's not just one player, but often it's a couple of players in a team with their artificial intelligence, with their version, right, of Deep Blue, and uh, playing other people. Is that, Samir, what Wall Street is going to start to be, this sort of game where investors are little teams operating with all of their artificial 
uh, intelligence and taking on other investors. Is that how maybe a, a, not a bad way to sort of see the future? I mean, I, I, I think I think that makes sense. I think uh, it's 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 going to be as I, as I alluded to before, humans with almost like an infinite army of analysts. You know, if you just think about an investment management landscape, typically you have a portfolio manager and you've got a couple of analysts, or even private equity for that matter. These are very lean teams and humans have, they're superhumans having gone through the investment banking boot camp so they can work 16 hours a day. And, and the, the argument there is you could learn a lot of what they do, especially on the analyst side, and then scale that search, whether it's deal origination. You, th there is, you, could, you could be really smart about what's going on by reading blogs, by, by looking at what management changes are happening in startups, which companies are going from being an early stage to a growth stage or late stage, which, which is where private equity can come in. Management changes, and you can do it at scale. You don't, so, so th th that's what we're talking about, and again, all of that stuff being done right feeds back to the human, and, and the human sort of just gets smarter and smarter than you know you were 10 years ago, for that matter. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that the real skill for humans, you know, going up that smartness curve would be curiosity more than anything else. Uh, I, I'm a true believer in education, uh, fast getting or traditional universities fast getting disrupted in this and you will just have to keep up with what's going on and how can you stay on top of it, and that would be your edge. You know, why don't we open up to some questions for, um, here in the audience? Do we have a, a mic circulating around? It's a small crowd, we could actually maybe have people just stand up. I, I can, can't even see some hands, I don't know, with the lights. Anybody? This is sort of interesting, that, uh, Samir, I had a question when you were talking about, you know, sort of, um, you know, the, the, the new sort of way you would staff up for this kind of situation. Um, traditionally, and I was gonna ask Robert a similar question, you know, it used to be that you would have armies of people uh, plowing through documents, right? 10Ks, all types of financial information. Um, uh, the equivalent of, I guess, like um, trying to uh, plant a field with a lot of people spreading seeds and stuff like that and trying to harvest all of themselves, right? But it's clear now that, you know, one person sitting on a combine could farm a lot more land, right, than, than, than even 100 people with shovels. Um, so I'm wondering, are we going to see a radical change in the way asset management firms, in the way banks, in the way investment banks suddenly staff up? Because a lot of the bodies that you used to hire were all uh, human software to some extent. I think skill set. <coughs> so again, I, I don't believe that role of humans will go away. I think the role humans play will change. So just a simple example uh, within AI landscape, right? So there's, there's an element of uh, machine learning, you, you know, machine learning, deep learning, AI, which is like the, the parent of that. There are two, two key concepts. There's unsupervised learning and there's supervised learning. Most models get built through supervised learning, which is you say, this is the data, and if this is the data, uh, this generated this output, can you find out what was the relation which led to that output? And that's supervised learning. Uh, given the way we are getting all this data, Robert, you made the point, the data is very messy, it's very dirty. Uh, you almost would, there won't be enough humans to sort of sift through that and say, well, this is how this works. Eric, that, 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 I was going to say, you're, you're in the business yeah. of, of, of dealing with that issue, right? You've got all this data and you've got yeah, to right. kind of clean it and package it and get it um, um, delivered to people in a useful format, right? Yeah, right. I, actually, I'd like to give a very typical example. That, that is a true story uh, because in, uh, within uh, 2018, quite a few Chinese uh, uh, companies are listed in NASDAQ. Um, and typical example, PIMCO um, quite often mentioned uh, they are using our, our alternative data. Uh, due to some some uh, issues ha happened back in uh, for those company happening back in China. As a matter of fact, we all know that China is 12 hours ahead of the Nasdaq, and also the the news could be in Chinese, but that does not mean 
those things that not happened, that not existed. But it could be readable. It could be uh, have sufficient time to to broadcasting here in uh, transfer here, here in uh, on the street here in Wall Street. And uh, the one thing that one day that uh, one company called the Chudan due to some uh, uh, scandals back in China, and uh, the the share price collapsed for one day. And for the past two days, no one knows. Uh, the, all the Wall Street does not know what what happened, and the share price dropped down by like 100 percent. And actually, those things already the scaled back in China. And also, another typical example that, like for uh, I think last year for McDonald. But one thing, what if a scandal ha uh, happened back in China or back in Russia and back in Japan? Those information could be in Chinese, Russian, and Japanese. So those could be re recognized by the NLP. And it could be processed by the computer. And also, one thing right now, for all the alternative uh, alternative data, data we, we are talking about the negative, positive, but that only but that's only only two uh, neutral, and th only three uh, uh, levels. But actually, we also need to recognize the the fairs, the market cycle. The market psychologies, and also the market confidence. One typical example is like a. I would like to quote like uh, for Chinese. What if a Chinese government and to reduce uh, to uh, reduce the the projection of the GDP from six percent to 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 five point nine percent? But normally, traditionally, uh, for all the uh, fundamental data, they will use only those two numbers. But and we try to try to calculate the market cycle, the market confidence towards those two uh, numbers. And what is the, the recognition from Chinese government, the Russian government, the Japan government, and what is the, 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 the state's market psychologies? Those could be realized nowadays by the machine, by the NLP. Yeah. Robert, um, what what industries do you think are going to be affected by AI besides the financial sector? Which, which industries are actually taking it up really quickly and seeing kind of quick results? Um, all of them. I mean, we're, we're, there are very few industries not looking at it. I think one that's been surprisingly fast is the industrial sector, heavy industry, um, where, um, you know, companies are using artificial intelligence in very creative ways to improve efficiency and it results in billions of dollars of extra revenue or savings. Um, you know, certainly in the consumer world, you know, you see Amazon and Facebook and, you know, those are the ones that are, uh, you know, that you see in the newspaper all the time. But I think there's a lot going on in, in other sectors that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Uh, we have a question. Perhaps I just heard, did you say that Maybe stand up. Did you say that supervised learning naturally has more explanatory power than unsupervised? No, I, I, I don't think I said that. I just said that in more cases than not, uh, you start with supervised learning and then unsupervised takes over once the model has grasped, has basically sort of understood how the, the, the particular phenomenon you're looking at works. And then it basically just keeps on taking results back into the feedback loop and then evolves itself. Oh, so the model under, book understands, but it has no explanatory power yet, right, necessarily. You can't tell a person why it made a decision. You, you can't tell a person why it made a financial decision or a medical decision. So it's, you know, useless. It, it depends on implementation. I actually belong to the camp where uh, do not rely on black boxes. I think you should always try to, again, this is the humans controlling it. And when, when the model does, make a decision, you should build it in such a way that you can sort of say, okay, this is why the model came to this decision. And I think it's possible. possible? Yes. So they currently have a deep neural net that have a deep explanatory power? Absolutely. I think, I think it's how you set up your DL, uh, DNNs. Uh, you can, this is, this is where, I think, I think there's nobody stopping you from doing a pure black box model and that would work fine except when it stops working, you have no idea why it stopped working. And to avoid that situation, you could take a different path where you say, 
Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break those stages down, and I'm going to try and see. And this is where you, as a portfolio manager, sort of ask your data scientists to sort of explain that, as opposed to just letting uh, academic statistics drive things. Yeah, actually, within the past one year, I was quite often saying that never use human beings' imagination to, to, uh, to measure the, the computer's uh, capacities. Um, I promised VDEC we'd keep on schedule. Robert, last question. Maybe you could tell us, um, there are people out there who, who are saying, gosh, I wish I could kind of invest in this space. Are the best opportunities really at the venture capital, private equity level, or are there actually public listed opportunities for people to take advantage of this AI revolution? I think that's, I mean, it's a very complicated question. I think, you know, there's certainly data vendors. I think a huge area that's uh, probably a little um, less on the radar screen is uh, tools and um, outsource services for, uh, for data. So not everyone is going to be able to afford an army of uh, artificial intelligence uh, programmers and data scientists, data engineers. And um, if you don't offer tools um, to manipulate the data effectively, um, the data is essentially going to be worthless. So I'm not sure I can point to any specifics uh, in public, but um, you know, those would certainly be the buckets, the data itself, as well as tools and services. Yeah, but I guess you're saying is that there, everybody's sort of using it. So for example, like Amazon tells us, if I like this, I'm going to also po probably like something else, right? Yes. And so, so everybody's kind of integrating it. So even public companies, um, uh, uh, all of them are really sort of being right. impacted. Uh, but the root of Amazon's ability to do that was a company that they acquired. And um, that was a long time ago. And since then, it's evolved, it's developed. And uh, it's become a lot smarter and a lot more complicated. So it's not as if there is an AI company, right? Because like a Microsoft, a Google, an Apple, everybody's in the AI game, right? Yeah, I mean, everybody's in the AI game. Certainly the amount of com sheer computing power that you need to process this stuff is, uh, is a huge factor. So being able, simply being able to put stuff in the cloud and rent computing time on demand is a massive innovation without which none of this could happen. Excellent. Let's give everybody a big round of applause. Thank you so much for kicking off this day. Folks, enjoy the rest of the couple of days. We'll switch over now to the next panel.